As we reported earlier, the theater lost one of its most influential composers today. Stephen Sondheim's melodies, music, and complex lyrics made him a giant in musical theater for five decades, with a range of work that stretched from Gypsy and West Side Story to Sweeney Todd to Into the Woods and many more. Our own Jeffrey Brown interviewed Stephen Sondheim in 2010 and talked to him about how he crafts his lyrics. I've often said, if you think of a lyric as a little one-act play, then each line is a scene. And, a, and you know, a quatrain becomes an entire act. Each and line is a scene. Each line is a scene, and you've got seven yeah. words in the... In, so, so, we got some, so let's say each word is a speech. Well, you know, if, if you're writing a play and something's wrong with the speech, you cut or change the speech. Same way you've got to do it word by word. It is as, as focused as that. And how you're always turning back to late from the grass and the stick and the dog and the light. How the kind of woman willing to wait, not the kind that you want to find waiting to return to the night. And the greatest focus is on words that rhyme. Sondheim writes lying down, better for a quick nap when things aren't going well, he says. He uses an old rhyming dictionary and a 1946 edition of Roger's Thesaurus. A rhyme draws the ear's attention to the word, so you don't make the least important word in the line the rhyme word. So you have to, and, and also a rhyme can take something that is not too strong and make it much stronger. If you tell a joke in rhyme, it's twice as funny as it would be if you just told it in prose, as if, you, if it was just a speech. The same words, but the rhyme goes, does that to it. And that's the, one of the uses of rhyme, is not only to focus the attention on the word, but to strengthen what you're saying. Now, sometimes you avoid a rhyme, because if, thing, if the, you don't want to draw the ear's attention the ear's to it, expecting ex exactly yeah. right, so you want to fool them. Because one, one of the things you want to do in a song, and in a scene, and in a play, is surprise an audience. He's a very smart prince. He's a prince who prepares. Knowing this time I'd run from him. He spread pitch on the stairs. I was caught unawares. And I thought, well, he cares. This is more than just malice. Better stop and take stock while you're standing here stuck on the steps of the palace. And that surprise, Sondheim says, can come in very subtle ways. There's something happening between the ear and the brain. For example, he believes words that are spelled differently but sound alike, such as rougher and suffer, engage the listener more than those spelled similarly, rougher and tougher. I think we see words uh, I, 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 on, as if they were on paper sometimes when you hear them. I don't mean it's an absolutely conscious uh, thing, but I'm absolutely convinced that people essentially see what they're hearing. For more on Sondheim's life and the legacy he leaves behind, I'm joined by Ben Brantley, former co-chief theater critic of The New York Times, and by Eric Schaefer, the co-founder and former artistic director of the Tony-winning Signature Theater here in Virginia. He has produced and directed multiple productions of Sondheim shows, including at the Kennedy Center. Gentlemen, uh, thank you both very much for being here on what is obviously a, 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 a really tragic day in this field. Ben Brantley, to you first, could you just remind us a little bit about why he lives in such a high esteem in the, in the pantheon of theater? Well, I think you can say he is truly without peer. When you look at earlier generations of composers, there, may, there certainly were giants like Rogers and Hammerstein, but there were others who wrote in that style. Sondheim was sui generis. And I, I came of age with Sondheim, really, so I feel the loss very personally. My first Broadway show was, was Follies when I was 16. But he was addressing an era in which the old convictions no longer held, and people were incredibly ambivalent about practically everything, their country, their futures, love. And he found the equivalent of those feelings in music. But it wasn't chilly, as has often been you know, sort of uh, lodged against him. There's incredible feeling in his ambivalence. And um, I mean, whether it's Assassins, which has been revived recently in New York, or a Company, his, his breakout hit, or Sweeney Todd, you, there's so much feeling and so much complexity. In a way, I think, is unmatched by anyone else. There, there won't be a Sondheim heir. Indeed. Um, Eric Schaefer, I know you had the opportunity to 
talk with Sondheim several times when you were producing and directing uh, plays and, and musicals of his. What was that process like? I mean, I would imagine to, to get on the phone or to meet in person with a, a legend like that, especially when you're working on his projects, how did that, how did that go down? How was that? Uh, it, it was amazing. I mean, I, I have to say with Sondheim, one of the things I think people may think um, is he was an amazing collaborator. He wanted to be in the room with you and have a conversation. Uh, he was not the one saying like, look, I'm, I'm the smartest in the room. No way was he like that at all. He was the most giving person at all of, uh, in the room, which was fantastic. And, and I think also, you know, as Ben alluded, I mean, he changed the face of musical theater that all of us looked up to. I mean, I saw Sweeney Todd was the first musical I saw of his when I was in high school on Broadway. And I literally came home, ran out, bought the album and just played it till the record wore, wore thin, literally looking at the lyrics and how smart and, and wonderful it was. So um, that's the thing I think that people don't realize about him. He, he was a great friend and a great mentor and and he was also about you know giving people a chance, which was which was here was a kid from myself, you know Fleetwood, Pennsylvania, uh, this little small town in Amish country that you know said, oh, I love your work, I want to do it, and and you know he totally embraced that, and you know I got to end up do over direct over thirty of his musicals over the years, which has been amazing. Wow, what a great experience. Um, ben Brantley, in that clip that we heard when he was talking with Jeffrey Brown, he described how he values each and every word, that each line is a speech, every word can be so freighted. And you certainly see that in his work, that he's, there, there's incredible complexity, but also a great wit, great simplicity, and yet a very, very direct, I mean, he really is a tremendous lyricist in that regard. Oh, I mean, and he was first known primarily as a lyricist. That was what people responded to, was the wit, were the bon mots. And you realize it, there's more weight to it than that. This isn't just sort of like Dorothy Parker cleverness. There's, um, there's a real uh, feeling in the weight of every word. And often the words are at variance with the music. So that kind of ambivalence I was talking about earlier will be tugging. There'll be a, a friction between what's being sung, like some of the pastiche numbers and follies, remembering a great love a different time. And then the music will say, you're lying, or it's more complicated. Um, Eric Schaefer, is there a particular moment, I mean, you worked on so many of his projects, but do you remember a particular moment of interacting with him where you really got a, a crystal sense of who the man was? Well, there, there's many, but I, I think, you know, one of my favorite memories was actually, um, I had dinner at his house and uh, uh, there was a meeting with myself and Michael Kaiser, who was running the Kennedy Center, when we pitched to him about doing the Sondheim celebration, where we actually did six of his musicals in repertoire in 2002. And I remember we left his house and a minute later my phone rang and, and it was Steve and he said, do you think they can really do this? And I was like, absolutely, Steve. I said, we can do it 300% and we won't let you down. And he was like, okay, let's do it. And, you know, that festival, I think, really relaunched his work into the world in a brand new way that people saw his work, even though they were seeing it again and again, they were seeing it for the first time in a brand new way. And that was in 2002. And, and I think it's something that Ben alluded to is like his work is so written for the character, which is so great. And it, that's why you see all of these revivals, because you can reinterpret his writing, because his writing is so brilliant and so strong, and it can stand that um, with someone bringing their ideas to what he's written. And Ben Brantley, last question to you. I mean, in the end, we know he was working up until the very end. Uh, there were reports that he was at, a, at some previews or something and just a few weeks ago. Um, what do you think you will most remember of him and from him? Oh, I think there's a song from uh, Pacific Overtures. It's one of his less well-known works, but uh, uh, it's uh, three uh, different people remembering the single event 
uh, momentous event in history, and they they're saying it's the um, it's the fragment, not the day. And I think Sondheim honors those fragments. I think more than any composer of musicals I can think of, it's a way of seeing what you get in Sunday in the Park with George. It's all those little points that go into making experience, life, and art. All right. Um, thank you both very much for being here. Ben Brantley, Eric Schaefer, appreciate your time. Thank you. Just when I stopped, open.